Okay, so welcome to a webinar presented by uh, the Landmark Inn State Historic Site, which is located in Castroville. Um, and we are going to talk a little bit about Castroville before settlement. So it wouldn't have been Castroville before settlement, obviously, but um, if you're not familiar, uh, Castroville was settled in 1844 by European settlers, but we're going to talk about uh, what and who was here before then. So let's get started. So we're going to talk about the prehistory of the area. You can see from this map here, um, we're going to be located right here, roughly. Um, if you can see my mouse, uh, you can see if you look, it says San Antonio de Bayar, and then we're going to be right outside of that, of course, here in Castroville. Uh, so the different indigenous groups that were here, um, of course, there were much later groups or earlier groups that were here, um, but we're going to focus on the two that had interactions with the settlers. Um, and that would be the Lai Pan Apache, who had their first recorded contact with the Spanish in the early 1700s as the Spanish settled the San Antonio area. Um, the records from the Spanish uh, missions uh, paint the groups as some were friendly, some were not, um, and some participated in trade with the Spanish, while some typically uh, kept to themselves unless they were attempting to raid into the San Antonio area. So, um, and of course, this part of um, the prehistory is a very, very brief explanation um, as to what the actual history is. Both of these groups could have their own uh, webinar just dedicated to them specifically. So it's just a brief history. Uh, so the next group is the Comanche. The Comanche were, um, by the 1750s, the Spanish had recognized three major Comanche groups. Uh, in the area, including one in the Medina River Valley, which is where Castroville is located, if you are not familiar. So, early Spanish exploration in this area um, consisted mostly of the San Antonio region. Um, now, there was some French exploration before this, but the Spanish accounts of the area start with um, what becomes the first Spanish map, which is um, the first mapping of the Gulf of Mexico, and this was done in 1519 by uh, Spanish explorer Alonso Alvarez de Pineda. Sorry if I butchered that. Um, I looked it up, but um, and he maps the coast as well as into a little bit of the coast. And then by 1718, the first Spanish mission is established in San Antonio. Uh, it's called the Mission San Antonio de Valero, which would become the Alamo. I'm sure you can see here um, by this historic building survey. Uh, it's listed as Mission San Antonio de Valero in parentheses, the Alamo. And you've got that uh, very famous facade of the outside of the Alamo. Uh, so this brings the first permanent European settlements to this area of Texas. Excuse me, got hiccups. So Spanish control continues until 1821 when Mexico gains its independence from Spain. Within the next year, Stephen F. Austin settles, well, he brings settlers into what is Tejas under Mexican control uh, and settles the old 300, which were um, a group that settled on the Brazos in 1822. So very quickly after Mexico allows European settlers to come into, um, or Anglo settlers to come into Mexican controlled Texas, um, they 
outlaw slavery in 1829. Um, they abolished slavery in all of its states, uh, in all of Mexico states. On April 6th, 1830, the president of Mexico at the time orders that the Texans um, comply with the emancipation or face military intervention. And this uh, is one of the many factors that builds um, both politically and socially leading up to the Texas Revolution. So to get around this, um, many of the Texan slave owners would change the title of their enslaved to indentured servants, um, which would be, of course, a lifetime um, or a lifelong servitude uh, to avoid the owning of slaves. So... So, like I said, there was a lot of things that led to the Texas Revolution, um, but the first kind of conflict um, begins in October of 35, and it's between the Texan colonists, groups of Tejanos living in Texas, which are um, people of Mexican, Spanish, and uh, Native American background um, and lineage, and this is against the government of Mexico. Uh, now this map here is a bit of an older map. I know that this has been um, updated with recent research, but it gives a good idea of, you can see San Antonio here, and it really is kind of a hub of conflict. Each of these are movements of different military groups. And then you've got, of course, Nacogdoches and then um, the San Antonio area. Of course, famously during the revolution, the Alamo Falls. And uh, you get the um, kind of rallying cry of remember the Alamo. So Texas becomes independent from Mexico uh, in April of 1836, Santa Ana is captured following the Battle of San Jacinto, and on May 14th of 1836, while he is imprisoned, he signs um, documents declaring Texas as independent, technically ending the conflict, um, but if you know a little bit about Texas history, it continues to be um, a lot of conflict for the next several years. Um, and uh, Texas continues to fight Mexico. And one thing that changed after Texas becomes independent is Texas, the government of Texas, the newly independent Texas, orders um, several major groups of Tejanos living in larger populated cities to leave and evacuate those cities, um, either go west, east into Louisiana, or down into Mexico. And this is a, in an effort to get Anglo Texans to come and uh, populate these larger cities, including San Antonio. So, so how does all of this relate to the Medina Valley? Now, um, as you know, um, or well, as many know uh, from this area, the area of Castroville is a uh, day's ride on a wagon from San Antonio. And the Medina River is a vastly rich area for um, wildlife. There's you know, uh, lots of water availability. This photo here is of uh, one section of the Medina, um, and you can see the old trees and um, how well flowing the river is in this moment. Right now, it's not that great, but <laughs> that is Texas in the summer. So we'll talk about the Tejano settlement on the Medina. Now, the exact date that Tejano settlement began along the Medina River in this area is unknown, but we do know, and it is documented, that by 1843, there is a established community with homes as well as an operating mill servicing parts of San Antonio. Now, 
the Castro colonists don't arrive until 1844. So this is, of course, pre, um, pre-Castro. Now, this is a clip from a newspaper article, and it is a eyewitness account from the 1843 flood. That's where we get that 1843 date. I, uh, I'm not gonna make you guys read the whole thing. So I condensed it um, to get the key points. So this was originally published in the Castroville Anvil in July of 1900. And it's a woman named Justine who was 14 years old in 1845, recalling what she was told about the 1843 flood. So in 1843, there was a Mexican settlement here, the present site of the August Holes House residence. H.Y. or Hi Arnold and his Mexican wife were engaged in the manufacture of shingles for the San Antonio market. The portion, that portion of the present town was flooded and all his loose shingles floated away. The packed ones were gathered up from mesquite trees near the present Eichen residence. So this is just to just to clarify, this is a news article that is published in 1900 of a woman recounting what she was told as a 14 year old in 1845 about the Mexican settlement that was there before Castro and the colonists arrived. Now, um, the Arnold family continued to live in the town and um, I've created several different maps for you to look at. So this is one of the original, um, you can see here, it says founded September 3rd, 1844. So that is when Castro and his colonists arrived. And this is the original land plot, one of them that was created. Um, now, just looking at this, it's a little confusing <laughs> with all of the, the, uh, the plot numbers and things like that. So I made it, little bit easier. Um, I went ahead and took from original documents from both Castro's original colonists, Castro's assistant, and um, land deeds. I took and inputted people's family names on the location of their original land plats. So uh, you can see here we've got Henry Castro has a large section as well as this is Houston Square, what would become Houston Square. And then these three belong to the church. So you would have uh, St. Louis built up there. And then over here, you've got Cesar Minaud and uh, Michael Simone or Simon, which is the landmark in. So I'm actually gonna show you, I took this original map and laid it over a current map of Castroville. So you can see Highway 90 goes through here. Right here is the landmark inn. And you can see things like Kinnick Park. The regional park is down here. It's over here actually, sorry. Um, but I highlighted a couple things to make it a little easier. So this red circle that you see is the approximate location of the Arnold uh, manufacturing mill where they produced shingles uh, for the San Antonio area that was flooded and they had to recover what they could. Okay. This little yellow box here is the landmark in roughly our property, um, just to give you a kind of an idea of location wise. So if you're from the area, um, all indications point to the area around Kinnick Park, kind of at the curve of the Medina um, to where that mill was. So I'm gonna go back real quick. So that would be about here. So just to give you an idea on the original land plots. So, um, here, mesquite trees near the present Icon residence. Now, this was the present as in 1900, um, and this map was produced um, 
based on the records from the original founding. So um, go back to this one, yeah. So once you lay the original map over the town, you can see um, where several of these roads have remained the same. Of course, you've got the the buildings and the homes and the structures that were taken um, down or moved to put in Highway 90. And that's where you get the edge of the landmark in right here, because we can look out on 90. Um, but just down the road and on the curve of Kennig Park is where estimated where this um, mill processing would have been in 1843. So to recap, there is evidence based on eyewitness accounts of a fairly successful Mexican Tejano settlement in Castroville, what would become Castroville, um, not exact on the dates of when it began, but we do know by 1843, there was a mill that was producing enough shingles that when it flooded, we ended up with the eyewitness accounts of having to recover those lost shingles. So this is a photo, uh, well, a drawing of the mill on the landmark in property, the Haas and Quintal grist mill. And each of these little lines is one of the floods that has occurred uh, in the recorded history of Castroville. So we've got the 1998 flood, and then you go all the way up, and you can see here where this red arrow is pointing. This is the estimated height of the 1843 flood had the Haas and Quintal mill been there. It was not, of course, but had it been there, this is as high as the water would have gotten. It's a little bit higher than the 1900 flood, but um, the predicted highest is, again, from that 1843 flood. It's unconfirmed if it was exactly, you know, this high or this high. So you can see here it's a 754 plus an unknown amount. So that is the guess on how high the floodwaters actually got. Now, when you're looking through the, the newspaper articles, the specifically the one that I have in the slideshow, it's talking about the 1900 flood while recounting the people who were alive during the 43 and aftermath of that flood. So um, unfortunately, I have not been able to find any direct quotes or eyewitness accounts from people who lived in the area during that flood, just recounting from what was heard and seen uh, the year after when Castro and the colonists arrived. So, so that was just a very brief introduction to the groups that were here before Castro and the colonists arrived. Um, this is something that will be expanded on in the future as research continues and hopefully something that we can come back and do kind of an updated, hey, this is the information we have now um, to bring kind of everything full circle. Um, I've added my email to both the chat as well as the end of this presentation. Just so if you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, you are welcome to reach out to me and um, I will open up, let me go back to the chat. I know we've got one Q&A question. Houston said, thank you. You're very welcome, Houston. Um, and like I said, this is a very brief kind of um, taste of the hopeful future research um, that's going to be continuing on. And um, there's several different primary sources that are that are yet to be explored. Um, and hopefully, like I said, in the future, we will be having 
another one of these uh, where we discuss the things that have been found. So if anyone has any questions or comments or concerns, um, you're welcome to type them in either the Q&A or the chat, and I would be happy to answer them. If not, I want to thank everyone for coming to the brief uh, kind of introduction to Castroville before it became Castroville or um, settlement before Castroville. Um, so if anyone wants to ask questions, now is your time and I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Josh and Houston. I look forward to telling everyone more. Um, it's a very interesting topic, and I think it's got a lot of potential um, to kind of expand the known understanding of, you know, who was who was here. And it's interesting being a property that has a mill on site here in Casterville. We're very proud of our mill, and it's so interesting to learn that there was another one before us. So thank you both. Yes, this uh, will, uh, Denise asked if it'll be available later on YouTube. It will. Um, it should be uploaded onto the Texas Historical Commission YouTube at some point. Um, but if you would like the recording of it before then, I would be happy to send you a link. Um, I can add your email to the list if you just uh, send me an email to um, the email that I'll type it in this answer as well. Uh, if you'll send me an email just so I can have yours ahead of time. And I'll add you to the list of people to um, email the, the link if you're interested, or you can wait until it's uploaded onto the YouTube. Every webinar that's done by the THC um, is available and will eventually be on our YouTube. So you can always go back and watch. So, well, if there are no further questions, I will um, end the webinar. And I thank you all for joining me for the brief lunchtime webinar. Um, and I'm happy to help and answer any questions that anyone else has. Feel free to email me or give us a call at the site. Um, and we are, we're here to help. <laughs>